Well, welcome everybody. S certainly glad you're here today. And uh, I'm glad I made it back from my trip. Thank you so much for your prayers. It was a good trip and uh, fruitful and I'm very thankful for that. Um, we're very tired, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, we're very happy that we were able to do that. So it's a real blessing. Well, today we're going to continue on in Ephesians, and it's Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. It's only two verses, but they're very important verses. <laughs> so we're going to look at those. The title of the lesson is, Why Were the Grace Gifts of Servant Leadership Given? Now, there's a story. Sometimes ministers and their congregations don't get along. In, work, in one church, things had gotten so bad that the elders arranged to meet with the minister and asked him to go. The minister, however, refused. I'm the servant of Jesus, he said. When Jesus tells me to go, I'll leave. But until Jesus gives the word, here I stay. So he did. Week by week, his congregation groaned through the services. Finally, one Sunday morning, the minister announced Jesus had given the word. He was moving to another ch another church. <laughs> As one, the congregation rose to their feet <laughs> and began to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> I like that story. <laughs> yeah, we've seen this kind of thing happen before. Well, you know, to avoid ending up like this poor church leader, Paul has set down the criteria to be a good leader. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Sorry, it's 11 through 16. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity uh, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceit, deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So what are the grace gifts of servant leadership today? Well, the grace gifts of leadership, or more accurately, servant leadership, are listed as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, or pastor teachers, depending on your interpretation. First, we need to define who this list is referring to. The gift of a uh, foundational apostleship is no longer around today, as no one in our day fits the criteria to be a foundational apostle. The teachings of the foundational apostles and prophets are what the church is built upon, Ephesians 2.20. Christ being the chief corner cornerstone and foundation, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11. The apostles were those who saw the Lord while he was on earth before he ascended into heaven, 1 Corinthians 9, 1. The Lord did true signs, wonders and miracles through them to authenticate their ministries, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Many of them wrote scriptures, Matthew, John, Peter, Paul, etc., they were persecuted, and all but one, John, were killed or martyred for the faith, and this included Paul. You can find this information in 1 Corinthians 4.9, uh, the pre-Nicene Fathers' writings, and the Book of Martyrs. Now, Paul said that he was the last in sequence of the original foundational apostles, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. The word he used for last in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 is 
Nechatos in Greek, which is the word used for the last number in a sequence, such as 10 would be in the numbers one through 10. Finally, we are to use the word of God through Jesus Christ taught to us by the apostles and prophets as the basis for our Christian life. 2 Peter 3.2 and Jude 17. There is no one today who can meet the biblical criteria to be a foundational apostle. Not C. Peter Wagner, not any of them. But there are apostles in the church today. They're mainly sent out ones, uh, messengers, mainly church planting missionaries and evangelists, but they're actually not, they're not foundational to the church. There are also no longer any foundational uh, prophets, Ephesians 2.20. Again, they, who, they wrote scripture, uh, Samuel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, etc. They were often martyred for the faith, Luke 11, uh, 47 through 48 and Revelation 18.24. The church has its foundation on the apostles and prophets, 2 Peter 3.2. And in Christ, the foundation and cornerstone, 1 Peter 2.6. Now, there are prophets today. They are those, though, who preach from the written word of God, through which the Holy Spirit still speaks to his church. The scriptures are living and active, Hebrews 14.12. And we are not to go beyond what's written, 1 Corinthians 4.6. Modern day apostles are to be held up to the same standards as any biblical prophet. I, did I say modern day prophets are to be held up to the same standards as any biblical prophet? What they prophesy must be biblical and what they predict must come true if they're saying it's a word from the Lord. Uh, that's Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3 and 18, 20. Otherwise, they are to be considered false apostles, and the church should not listen to them. And that's Jeremiah 23, 16, Matthew 7, 15, 2 Peter 2, 1, 1 John 4, 1, etc. This criterion also applies to any of the grace gifts. If evangelists are preaching a false gospel, Galatians 1, 9, they're under condemnation, and the church should reject them. If pastors and teachers are not teaching sound doctrine, as in 2 Timothy 4.3, Titus 1.9, and 2.1, they are to be regarded as heretics and rejected after a few admonitions if they do not repent, and that's Titus 3.10. So today the role, the main role of a prophet is to exegete. Pull out what God is saying from the written word. Jesus Christ speaks to us through his word. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. To instruct and edify the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 31. The modern prophet does not rely on his own interpretation. 2 Peter 1, 20. The Holy Spirit speaks through the living written word, which we're not to go beyond. And out of that comes the guidance of the Lord for the church. As a prophet elaborates on the word, prophecy for the church today often comes forth. I've seen it many times. I've seen it happen with Jacob. And he doesn't ever say, I'm a prophet. But he has prophesied by preaching the word of God. As a prophet elaborates upon the word, Prophecy for the church today often comes forth. The Lord can and still sometimes does speak through dreams and visions. But again, dreams and visions must be tested by the scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. The written word is our highest authority because the Holy Spirit breathed the words through men, the very word of God, 2 Timothy 3.15-16. I would also add that you can be sure that those who give themselves the title of apostle or prophet today 
blowing loudly on their own horn before men are false apostles and false prophets. 2 Corinthians 11, 9, Mark 13, 22. The roles of evangelist, pastor, and teacher continue today as they did in the first century. Now that we've established who modern day apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are, let's move to the main reason why these grace gifts of servant leadership were given. Let's step through the passage above. Verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service. First, the purpose of the grace gifts of servant leadership is to prepare God's people for works of service. If a person is not a servant himself, he will not know how to train others to be servants. Servants serve. They're not get there to get others to serve them, which is what we see in a lot of mega churches. We serve God first, then we serve others. On the other hand, false teachers are full of pride. They're self-absorbed, self-proclaimed leaders. They claim gifts from God, yet take advantage of people. They give themselves big titles and they lord it over men. They have no idea how to be servants themselves. Therefore, they cannot prepare anyone for works of service in the body of Christ or teach them how to preach the gospel to the word, world. True apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers use their grace gifts to serve in humility. Verse 12 uh, goes on, so that the body of Christ may be built up. You know, this isn't talking about numbers or church size or salvation statistics. It's talking about the spiritual body of Christ being built into a house. Let me read Ephesians 2.19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. To him, the whole building is joined together and rises up to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This passage is talking about the same building, the church. It's a spiritual building, not a physical temple. The Holy Spirit now dwells in the temple of the individual spirit of the true believer and in the body of Christ as a whole. As leaders, we're not to be concerned as much with quantity numbers as with quality discipling Christians to maturity. We care what people believe, that they believe the right thing and that they do and act like uh, and, and, and what they do and act like is in line with that belief. The reason for the grace gifts is not to build big churches but to build upon the, upon the foundation of Christ taught by the apostles and prophets. This means that those who have the grace gifts of servant leadership will be teaching sound doctrine as a basis for true unity. Of course, Titus 1.9 says, he the overseer will, will, must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Titus 2.1, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Moving on to verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. So then unity is not referring to ecumenical unity or unity for the sake of making friends. It's not talk, talking about interfaith dialogue or coming to unity with other religions. It's not even talking about unity we already share in the Holy Spirit uh, because we are born again in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We already have that as the body of Christ. 
So what kind of unity is this talking about? It's talking about unity in the faith, unity in doctrine, unity in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of the gifts is to bring about unity in the core doctrines of the faith and in the knowledge of the character and will of God. Heretics, the divisive ones, can break unity in the faith. This is why we're to reject divisive heretics because they cause disunity in the body of Christ. Titus 3.10 is war, says warn a, uh, Paul says warn a divisive person of what? person once and then warn them a second time and after that have nothing to do with them. Of course we know that the word there is in the KJV is heretic. The actual word is hereticos in Greek. A heretic is a person who teaches against the core doctrines of the faith. Second Peter 2 1 but there were also false prophets among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift dis destruction on themselves. Romans 16, 17, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. You know, heresy causes divisions over the core doctrines and puts obstacles or roadblocks in the way of people becoming mature in the faith. I've, I saw that happen all over uh, time and again in Micronesia. And it, today it's happening all over the world because churches are unwilling or unable to reject false teachers. The next thing Paul says we need to do is become Mature, verse 13. How can someone with the grace gifts teach someone else to be mature if they themselves are not? They cannot, obviously. So what does becoming mature mean? It means growing from an infant to an adult spiritually. It means going from milk to solid food. It means growing in wisdom and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6.1, therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. Colossians 1.10, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Hebrews 5.13-14 through 14 says, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Notice that those who are mature eat solid food. And the solid food trains them to distinguish good from evil. Infants can't tell the difference between good and evil. The other day, uh, you know, it wasn't so long ago when I was living in Hawaii, I was driving uh, in my car and I was very close to my house and I came around the corner and slammed on the brakes because there was a two-year-old child right in the middle of the road. Oh man, that was scary. And he just stood there, he wouldn't move. So I drove up alongside him and told him, you need to get out of the road. Where's your mommy? Finally, his mother came running out of the house and grabbed him. You know, little children just don't know what's good or bad for them. That's why many baby Christians can be easily led astray by heretics. It's very important for those in servant leadership to prepare the body of Christ to eat solid food so that they can tell what's right and wrong, and then stand up against false teaching, false prophecy, and false anointings. Verse 13 goes on, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Can any Christian be exactly like Christ? 
Well, certainly that is our goal. But while we're here on earth, we still have our old sin nature in the flesh and mind and the temptations of the enemy to contend with. Jesus was in the same situation we are, but never sinned. We will never be able to make that claim. Fortunately, as we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man, died in our place to pay the wages of death for our sins. When we're under the blood of Christ, God the Father no longer sees our unrighteousness, but sees the righteousness of his son through the blood he shed for us. However, that doesn't mean we're sinless, and it certainly doesn't mean we don't continue to grow to maturity in Christ, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. To do that, we must be crucified with Christ daily. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Luke 9.23, then he said to them, them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We no longer live as Christians from the desires of the flesh, but we live by faith in the Son of God. The perfect measure of the fullness of Christ will have its ultimate fulfillment when we're resurrected to eternal life. But there is also a fullness and abundant life to be experienced now as we are crucified with Christ and follow him. John 10, 10 b says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But we will not experience that life unless we grow to maturity in Christ. He will help us grow, but we must submit to his Holy Spirit teaching us. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, now to him who's able to admit it, to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We are saved by grace. And it's also the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Who can bring us to the fullness of Christ? We cannot do that on our own. What we must do is to submit to the Spirit, study and obey the Word, stay in sound doctrine. Verse 14 says, then we will no longer be infants. Babies or small children cannot swim in a rough sea. They will drown. Mature adults know how to swim. How? Well, they've studied swimming, practiced swimming, and know how to survive. Spiritual babies have little understanding, and so the seas of doctrinal confusion can swallow them under. Those with the grace gifts are to bring spiritual babies to maturity by teaching them sound doctrine and giving them the tools to survive in the ocean in the oceans of life. This is the main reason for the grace gifts. Verse 14, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. The winds of false teaching today are greater than ever before in the history of the church. Many Christians have abandoned the truth for teachers to tell a lot of stories. I think you'd be embarrassed. Let's read 2 Timothy 4, 4 through uh, 4, 3 through 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
but after their own lusts, they will heap, up, heap to themselves teachers with itching ears, having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. They are false leaders. And though a few of them may even have natural gifts they mistake for spiritual ones, they're using those gifts for greedy gain to become famous. Their followers no longer have a love of the truth and are baby immature believers at the very most, if they're believers at all. Those who are true leaders in the body of Christ will prevent Christians from being tossed about by every wind of doctrine, by being watchmen. A, a shepherd not only feeds the flock, but also guards it from the wolves. We know that from Ezekiel 33, 6. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people not be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Also Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And Acts 20, 29, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous, grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. That's what they do. Verse 14 goes on, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Here we find that those who teach false doctrine are also schemers. Their cunning and crafty ways show that they have another spirit. Satan is the father of lies, not the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they are often after people's money or a following, or fame, or power over people. They teach the things that people most want to hear because they know they'll reap the rewards of fame and fortune. They claim to be sheep, but they're wolves that eat sheep for breakfast. It's these very schemers that those with true grace gifts of servant leadership must steer people away from. The apostles and even the prophets of the Old Testament did that by naming names. We can do no less. Verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love. Oh, a key verse here. Now we move on to how to accomplish bringing Christians to maturity and unity in the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We must speak the truth, and we must love people. We must speak the truth in love. The most loving thing you can do for a non-Christian is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. The most loving thing you can do for a Christian is to teach him the truth so he can grow. The most loving thing you can do for a deceived Christian is to show him the truth and warn him away from false teachers. The most loving thing you can do for a deceiver is to rebuke him sharply once or, once or twice. Then if he refuses to repent, which is almost always the case, he's, he has to be rejected. Turn him over to the, to the enemy for the destruction of his body so that the spirit may have the opportunity to be saved. We take that from 1 Corinthians 5, 5 and 1 Timothy 1, 20. If he repents, then accept him back into the body. If he doesn't, warn others away from him. Don't let him near the flock and continue to pray for his salvation. But do everything out of love. I love how Jude described our duty. Jude 20 through 25. But you, dear friends, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save, and save them. 
and to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, be your for all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Verse 15 goes on. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. We are to grow up, mature. We're to grow up to be like Jesus Christ. He's our head. We're not the head. He is the head. We are the body and must continue to grow spiritually. It's the responsibility of those with servant leadership grace gifts to uh, be sure Christians are growing into the likeness of Christ. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And that can only be done through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You know, and that that's the only way it can actually be done. Verse 15, we will in all things grow up into him who uh, is, that is Christ. So, you know, we, we need to grow up. We need to be more like Christ every day. 16, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting li ligament. We are the one body, and we are one body in the faith. A body can't live without the head, it can't function properly without a thumb, an eyeball, a leg, etc. Try running without your legs or seeing without your eyes. The body of Christ is not joined together by some kind of ecumenical or interfaith unity, but by the Holy Spirit. The unity is then strengthened and brought to maturity by the unity uh, we have because of our common belief in and obedience to the commands of God and his word. And it goes on, it grows and builds itself up in love. As we grow in the unity of the essentials of faith, we will grow in love. As we become mature, stay away from false teachers, reach out in love to those who are fail, falling, we build ourselves up in love. Love is more than saying you love someone or something. It's an action. Love is not afraid of being persecuted or hurt for the sake of the truth. Love is not the sickeningly, sickeningly sweet romantic ideas of love we see and hear so much about these days in movies and even at church. True love consists of sacrifice, even to the point of death. Are Christian leaders willing to suffer persecution for their stand for the truth? If not, then the body of Christ cannot be built up in love. Verse 16, as each part does its work. The main problem today in the churches is that each part is not do, no longer doing its work. Many Christians have been convinced that their main goal in life is, oh, say, to do spiritual warfare in the heavenlies or to bind territorial spirits, to spend time on the carpets of churches laughing and acting like animals, to be drunk in the spirit, to make a big pharisaical show of, out of giving money, to travel to where the newest Christian show is being put on to get another anointing that actually doesn't exist. To pretend to worship God when they're singing with arms uplifted in churches while they live like the devil during the week. To be in unity with anyone who simply says they believe in Jesus no matter how wrong their theology is or how weird they act. To build huge mega churches and spend all their time thinking up programs and none of their time preaching the gospel. 
to be afraid to be discerning while judging in all the ways hypocritically. These are the signs of leadership in the churches that have been for, have forgotten their role to bring Christians to maturity and get them away from false teaching. They have lost the main reason for the grace gifts, according to Ephesians 4. It's my prayer that more Christian leaders will rediscover the reason they've been given grace gifts of spiritual leadership, of servant leadership. I pray they will use these gifts in line with the will of God as given us in the written word of God. Those who love the, love the Lord obey his command.